Hello everyone Hyper here and welcome to the patch 8.3 Frost DK guide. This video will be mostly focused on raiding but the information I share can be used in other parts of the game as well. I haven't made a full guide since patch 8.1 I believe so in this video I'll go over everything from super basic stuff to the more advanced tips and tricks um, and I will cover talents, rotation, azurite, essences, gearing um, and pretty much anything you would need to uh, step into a mythic raid. So without further ado, let's get started. First up is the talents. Now the Frost DK talents for mythic raiding are fairly straightforward. In tier 1 you will always take Cold Heart. It has a very strong interaction with Pillar of Frost because you get extra strength, so your Cold Heart would, will hit harder. Also the recharge time, so the time it takes for your Cold Heart to stack back up to 20 is the same time as your Pillar of Frost to come off cooldown. So those two sync up very nice. And also if you run Blood of the Enemy, that's an extra interaction that will boost the damage of your Cold Heart. Tier 2, you will always take Runic Attenuation because more Runic power means you can have longer uptime on Breath of Sindragosa. In tier 3, it's a utility row, it's really situational and up to you. Asphyxiate or Blinding Sleet are probably the go-to in most scenarios because they just give you a little bit of ad control if you need it. Most notably, these two talents can be used if you're running more than 40 corruption, so you're spawning things from beyond. So you can either Asphyxiate them or you can Blinding Sleet them so you don't take that damage. Also on certain fights like Elganoth, you can use your stun or your blind to CC an ad that's focusing you to cause it to refixate. In the tier 4 row, you go Frozen Pulse in about 90% of the situations. It's just very good extra damage that is just passively added to your character. However, there is an argument to be made for Frost Sight if you're looking for large AoE damage. Most notably on Hive Mind and maybe Carapace if you're looking to pad a little bit. But if you're looking for large AoE damage, then you can take Frost Sight. And the only thing that changes about your gameplay with Frost Sight is that you will be using that button instead of Obliterates uh, whenever you have more than two targets. Or on single target, if you get a Killing Machine proc, you also use Frost Sight instead of Obliterate. In Tier 5, I have two options that I like to run. Either Permafrost on fights that don't require basically any movement and you're taking large amounts of damage. Permafrost is a pretty significant amount of self-healing if there's permanent damage going on in the fight. However, Frost DKs are a naturally tanky class because we have AMS, we have IBF, we also have a very large health pool compared to other classes. So in 99% of situations, you don't need to rely on Permafrost to be able to survive a fight. So in those situations, I go Wraith Walk just for the extra mobility. In tier 6, again, you have two choices, but in most situations, you will take Gathering Storm because it's just a great amount of damage. And especially if you're running a Frozen Tempest trait, whenever you're cleaving um, or any type of AoE, GS, um, Gathering Storm with your Remorseless Winter, will do a pretty significant amount of your overall damage. The only time you don't take Gathering Storm is if you need to take Frostworm's Fury for a very short burst window on some adds that typically only live a few seconds. To give you an example, adds like the shards on Rathion can be Frostworm Furied, or on Hive Mind, if you're looking at a particular wave that your guild is struggling on, you can take Frostworm Fury to essentially just uh, nullify that. But in most situations, Gathering Storm will end up being higher overall damage. And in tier 7, of course, we take Breath of Sindragosa in all cases, all circumstances. I do want to mention that there is an alternate talent build that we call the Ice Cap build, uh, where in the last row you take Ice Cap, but that changes up basically everything. Um, and even though it's kind of on par with the Breath of Sindragosa build for pure single target, Mythic encounters are not pure single target, and Breath of Sindragosa gains a lot of value. So I suggest going with the Breath build for all of the Mythic fights. Next, let's go over stats. So I will give you a general idea of what stats you should be looking for. But in general, I suggest simming your character because that will be way more accurate than me just telling you what stats you should stack. 
On Frost DK, Mastery is by far our most valued stat. On pure single target, Crit and Mastery are close together, but as soon as you add in any type of cleave, Mastery pulls ahead. So you should look to have as much Mastery as possible. And there is no soft cap for any of these stats that is reachable this expansion. The second one is Critical Strike. Now crit on single target is very valuable, on AoE it loses a little bit of value just because of how good mastery is. So mastery should be your highest stat, crit should be your second highest in most situations. Now after that you have haste, which is a decent stat, it increases your rune regen so you're able to pump out more obliterates during your breath of Sindragosa, so you're able to keep your breath up longer. However, point for point, haste is not as valuable as mastery or crit, but if you have a piece with like haste mastery, don't worry about it, it is still good. Now, some frost decays will rank versatility above haste, however, most frost decays will play conflict and strife as a minor essence, which I will talk about later. So versatility is not all that valuable to have on your gear. I typically have around 500 to 800 ish. Also, under stats, I suppose I should mention enchants and gems. Just enchant for mastery and for gem you want to have one strength gem and the rest just go for mastery gems. Um, on your main hand weapon I suggest having the razor ice enchant and on your offhand you should have fallen crusader. I'm not going to go into why you should have those on main hand and offhand in that order but just know that razor ice main hand, fallen crusader offhand and you're good to go. Next up is Azerite gear. With this tier, we are getting a new Azerite trait, which is Heart of Darkness, that is actually pretty good for Frost DKs if you have at least 25 Corruption. So I suggest having as many Heart of Darkness traits as you can, and then outside of that, you should have one Frozen Tempest trait, uh, just to give you that free Howling Blast proc whenever you cleave at least three targets with your Remorseless Winter. And it's also an extremely valuable trait on a cleave. So if you're looking at maximizing your damage on AoE fights, you can stack more than one Frozen Tempest. But for single target fights that have the occasional cleave, uh, you can get away with just having one of them. And then the next trait that you kind of want to have is Icy Citadel. For single target, Icy Citadel is pretty good, but the more targets you add to the fight, the lower the value of Icy Citadel will be and the higher the value of Frozen Tempest will be. There's a few other traits that are decent as well, but these are my top three. So Heart of Darkness is my top, Frozen Tempest to have at least one of, and then Icy Citadel, and that will be best in most raid situations. For tertiary traits, I suggest going for Overwhelming Power. If a piece doesn't have that, then go for Unstable Flames. If it doesn't have that, then potentially go for Gut Ripper. If it doesn't have any of those three, then it's most likely not a good Azerite piece. I guess I should also mention the defensive traits a little bit. Resounding Protection is probably our best trait, then you can go for Impassive Visage or the Anti-Magic Shell Boosting trait, uh, both of those are about equally good, because this tier there's not really any particular mechanics that require you to have a huge AMS. Now let's talk about Trinkets real quick. Um, Frost DK is stuck in the situation that a lot of other classes are stuck in, in that Ashara's Font of Power from Eternal Palace is still our best in slot. Now this trinket is an unused you channel it for 6 seconds and you get strength from it for 30 seconds. Super good trinket because it's up for most of your Breath of Sindragosa. Then for your second trinket slot there's a few options. You can go either for a Corrupted Gladiator's Badge which is the PvP trinket that is also unused and it gives you primary stats or you can go for an Ash Vein's Razor Coral that again is from Eternal Palace which you apply to the target and it starts stacking then towards the end of the fight, well as a Frost DK um, during every Breath of Sindragosa you consume those stacks that you built up on your target to get extra crit. Since it's still fairly early in the patch you might have to play with Razor Coral but if you have a badge from PvP that's like 445, 450 eye levels or higher I definitely suggest playing with that instead of Coral. There are a few other trinkets that are decent as well but I'm not going to list all of them so if you're curious if a trinket is good or not that you have in your bags just go to raid bots and sim it, it's the easiest way to find out.
Okay, next let's talk about essences. So in your major slot, you basically have two options. Blood of the enemy will be your go-to option in most situations, and this is only if you have rank 3. If you don't have rank 3, then listen on a little bit later where I talk about the other one. But Blood of the enemy is a great major ass essence to have because it syncs up with your Pillar of Frost and Breath of Sindragosa, and it just allows you to do so much damage in that 10 second window where you have the extra crit. If you don't have Blood of the Enemy, or if a fight requires no movement at all and you can just stick to your target 100% of the time without having to move, then you can play World Vein Major. Now World Vein Major is a 1 minute cooldown and you just activate it and it drops some shards that give you main stat. Now main stats or primary stats are very valuable for Frost DK because of our Pillar of Frost modifier that increases our strength percent. So if you don't have Blood of the Enemy rank 3 and you're forced to run World Vein, in most situations it's not that big of a DPS loss. Just make sure that you try to stay as still as possible once you activate it. You don't want to drop World Vein, then run away from the shards, arrange them and not get the stats that they provide. For minor essences, you do have a few options. The one that you will always have locked in is Memory of Lucid Dreams Minor because this essence has a chance to refund some resources. And whenever you get a refund, it means that you can use more resources during Breath of Sindragosa, so you can keep it up longer. So in every single situation, you have Memory of Lucid Dream uh, slotted in as a minor essence. For the other two slots, you do have a few options. One great option is Conflict and Strife, because it does provide a significant amount of versatility and most Frost DKs have naturally low versatility amount on their gear, so this kind of supplements that. Another option could be Essence of Focusing Iris, however this has become a lot less popular this patch. The last two options that I would suggest running are the new Essences, the Formless Void, which grants you strength whenever someone uses their major Essence, and this is especially good if your tanks are running the Crucible of Flame Major, because it means that you will have near perfect uptime on the strength buff from the Formless Void. Your last option is Breath of the Dying, which especially at rank 3, uh, where you need to get revered with Uldum to obtain that, is a very strong essence on single target, but it gains a lot of value on fights where there are adds, so you get that increased proc rate whenever they're in execute range. So I know I mentioned a lot of essences, but your best setup in most situations will be Blood of the Enemy Major, Memory of Lucid Dream Minor, Conflict and Strife Minor, and then I suggest going with Breath of the Dying Minor. However, you can substitute in Formless Void. Okay, this next section take with a grain of salt, because anything I say can change and will most likely change whenever Blizzard does another balancing patch and that is the corruptions. So for pure single target, there are a few corruptions that you should be looking for. Infinite Stars has very high value if you can stack it up to 10. However, as soon as you add even one other target in the encounter, Infinite Stars loses a lot of value. This is because you can't control which target it procs on. So for, as an example, Shadhar is a great encounter to have Infinite Stars on because there are no other targets that it could proc. However, if you look at a fight like Carapace of Nazoth that has a ton of adds, Infinite Stars has nearly zero value. Then the other one is Gushing Wound. Now this corruption is super rare to get, but if you can get it on a piece, uh, it's a very high value corruption to have because it's a high DPS increase per point of corruption. So on pure single target, Infinite Stars and Gushing Wound are my S tier corruptions. Now my A tier corruptions for single target would be Severe, which increases the amount of crit you get from all your sources, and the second one would be Masterful, which increases the amount of mastery you get from all sources. These are good passive traits and they will be very consistent from pool to pool, whereas Infinite Stars and Gushing Wounds might have some RNG and variance pool to pool. In the B tier category, I would probably place the Twisted Appendage Corruption that spawns Little Mind Flay Tentacles and the Strike Through Corruption, which increases the amount of damage you do with critical strikes. So on single target, you will typically want to run a little bit more crit than you do on AoE, 
And on pure single target, uh, getting an extra bonus from your crits is pretty nice. And also the Mind Flay tentacles do proc fairly often, and on single target, they're pretty significant damage boost. Every other corruption, um, I would suggest simming it. And obviously, even within these corruptions, there are multiple tiers. Uh, so tier one, tier two, and tier three. So while you might have a tier three of a lower, obviously there's a ton more corruptions and all of these corruptions also have multiple tiers. So if you're confused about which corruptions you should run in which situations, just make sure to run your sim on raid bots and that should give you a fairly good answer. Now for cleave and AOE, our best corruption changes a little bit. If you're doing sustained AOE, Twilight Devastation is absolutely brutal. It's an S tier corruption. It will do so much damage if you have sustained AOE because DKs have a naturally high health pool. The second one, even on AOE, Gushing Wound scales fairly well, but again, it's a super rare corruption, so you might not be able to get your hands on that. Then in the A tier for AOE, I would definitely go for Masterful, which increases the master you gain from all sources. And also, even after the nerf, Echoing Void is fairly decent on AOE. In the B tier, I would place Severe, which is the crit increase, and Honed Mind, which is the proct mastery. So it has a chance to proc like 900 mastery for 10 seconds, and that depends on the tier. But getting more mastery on AoE is obviously very beneficial, so if you can get your hands on that, that's also a great corruption to get. And of course, just like for single target, there are a ton of other corruptions and multiple tiers, so if you're confused, just make sure to sim it. One question that I get very often that relates to corruption is how much of it should you run? And this is a very difficult question to answer because it will depend on the boss fight. On easy fights, you can get away with playing 50 corruption because there's not much else going on. However, on more difficult fights, you typically want to stay below 40. So next, let's talk about the opener and what your rotation should look like during your cooldowns. Six seconds before the pull, you will want to start channeling your font of power. And then one second before the pull, you will cast your pre-pot and then go hit the boss with three obliterates. If you get any Howling Blast procs in this time, go ahead and use them because that will just apply the debuff to the boss and also give you a little bit of extra time back to regen some runes. After you cast your three obliterates, you want to use your Empower Rune Weapon and then your Breath of Syndragosa and Pillar of Frost at the same time. I suggest just macroing these two together. Just make sure you're not on the GCD, otherwise they will not get used at the same time. From there, your next ability will be always Remorseless Winter, and then you just want to start obliterating to keep up your Runic Power and your Breath of Syndragosa. I advise against spamming obliterates because this will overcap you on Runic Power um, and exhaust your runes super fast. Instead, what you want to do is wait until you dip below about 75 Runic Power, then you obliterate. The only time you would ever obliterate above 75 runic power is if you're capping on runes, which typically happens at the very beginning of your Breath of Syndragosa, but from there on it shouldn't be the case. About 5 seconds into your Breath of Syndragosa, your second unused trinket should come off cooldown and you want to press that as soon as possible. And along with this, you also want to press your blood of the enemy. At this point, you should have 10 seconds left on your Pillar of Frost. So for the next 10 seconds is when you will do the peak of your damage. So you just want to get obliterates out to keep up your Breath of Syndragosa. And then when your Pillar of Frost is about to run out, you want to use your Chains of Ice to consume your Cold Heart stacks. From there on, you just hit obliterates to keep up breath. And if you're a Blood Elf, you can also use Arcane Torrent to get a little bit of extra Runic Power. During this entire time, if you do get Howling Blast procs, you should prioritize using them unless you're in danger of dropping your Breath of Syndragosa. So if you're below like 40 runic power, then be careful using those Howling Blast procs. But if you're comfortably sitting above 40, then you can use them as they come up. Once Breath of Syndragosa is over, our rotation is super standard. You want to cast your Remorseless Winter as soon as it comes off cooldown, and then just spam out some Obliterates after it to increase your Gathering Storm stacks, so you do more damage with that Remorseless Winter. And during this time, you will use Frost Strike to spend your Runic Power, use your Howling Blast procs as you get them, and use Obliterates to spend your runes. 
Now, when your Pillar of Frost comes off cooldown, you want to go ahead and use it. And I suggest having a few runes saved up for it. And also during your Pillar, when it's about to run out, your Cold Heart will be stacked back to 20. So you want to go ahead and cast Chains of Ice before your Pillar of Frost runs out. Typically, you will be able to get two casts of Pillar of Frost between every Breath of Syndragosa. However, if circumstances kind of force you to shift your cooldowns a little bit, you might be able to get only one Pillar of Frost between your cooldowns, and that's fine as well. This will change from boss to boss, so I suggest either look up a video about the specific boss, or just take a look at Warcraft logs and see what some of the top DKs are doing on that particular encounter. Alright, this next section is what I call advanced tips because you don't really need to do these, but if you do, you will get a little bit of damage increase and if you're trying to min-max, then this section might help you out a little bit. The first one that is fairly minor, but most players still do it at the top end, is min-maxing your Gathering Storm stacks. So with Remorseless Winter and Gathering Storm Talented, whenever you press it, and then you use runes, you obviously increase your stacks of GS, so your Remorseless Winter does more damage, and you also increase its duration. During Bloodlust, you should be able to increase the duration of your Remorseless Winter so long that you're able to recast another Remorseless Winter. And if you're able to do that, that is a fairly nice damage increase, because whenever you, you recast your Remorseless Winter, it retains the 10 stacks of Gathering Storm, so that entire Remorseless Winter will deal maximum damage. Also outside of Bloodlust, whenever your Remorseless Winter is about to come off cooldown, you should have at least 3 runes saved up. And this is because as soon as you cast Remorseless Winter, you want to also cast an Obliterate right after to ramp up those Gathering Storm stacks. It's not that important to do, but it is a tiny DPS increase, so you might as well. The second thing in advanced tips is AMS usage. Now AMS can be a super powerful offensive cooldown. Most people think of it as a defensive, but for a Frost DK, when I think AMS, I think what can I AMS for extra runic power? And luckily in Nihilotha, basically every single boss has an ability that you can AMS to get more runic power for. And this interaction can be extremely useful during your Breath of Syndragosa, because it can get you those extra few seconds to get some runes back so then you can extend your Breath of Syndragosa. So AMSing hard hitting magic abilities will get you a pretty significant chunk of runic power. If you're curious about what abilities you should AMS on each encounter, you can check out the spreadsheet that I have linked in my Discord. Um, I have every single boss and what ability you should be looking to AMS. But basically, any time your Breath of Syndragosa is rolling, you should be looking for abilities to AMS. Also within cooldown usage is obviously Cold Heart. And min-maxing how hard your Cold Heart hits goes all the way back to Legion. In my rotation section, I mentioned that you should cast it at the end of your Pillar of Frost. And that's alright for most players, but if you're looking to min-max, there's an extra step to it. And that is, of course, our Unholy Strength procs. I suggest having some sort of weak aura that indicates when you're on Holy Strength procs, and also a weak aura that keeps track of your Pillar of Frost. Because if your Unholy Strength is about to run out and your Pillar of Frost still has like 3 seconds on it, or 4 seconds on it, you still want to cast that Cold Heart because you get an extra benefit from Unholy Strength from that extra stats that you do have. On the other hand, if your Pillar of Frost still has like 8 or 9 seconds and your Unholy Strength is running out, I would roll the dice and try to gamble on another proc before your Pillar runs out. If you're running Frost Room's Fury for any of these fights, the same logic applies to getting a huge Frost Room Fury hit as it does for a big Cold Heart hit. However, with Frost Room Fury, you need to keep in mind that more targets always means more damage rather than trying to min-max that one hit. So if you can hit one target with a perfectly synced up combo, it's still going to be less damage than hitting two targets with maybe just getting Pillar of Frost and no Unholy Strength. Thank you so much for watching this video, I really appreciate it, and if it helped you out, please subscribe to the channel and like this video. And if you want to chat with me or get some updates, you can also join my Discord, which is linked in the description box. Or if you want to watch me stream live and chat with me while I'm killing some bosses, 
you can watch me over on Twitch at Hyperion29. Again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.